Oh. Okay, so thank you. So uh, I will be discussing some aspects of uh, normally induced actions uh, using a conformal field theory momentum space. And I think there's been already a talk by, by Costas on uh, uh, why, why we use conformal field theory momentum space. Essentially, there are some, um, it's not just uh, something that we do because uh, uh, we want to go to momentum space for uh, whatever reason, but one of the most important I think is because of anomalies and because of the connection with amplitudes. And uh, many people work on amplitudes in uh, in ADS CFT formulation, Witten diagrams, and everything. And uh, therefore, conformal theory in momentum space has has got some momentum. And uh, when, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, just mentioning that when we have uh, uh, when we go to momentum space, we can actually capture the contribution of the anomaly in the correlation function. Now, this is not possible in coordinate space. And uh, the reason why it's not possible is because uh, most of the techniques that have been developed in uh, coordinate space uh, consider um, correlators at these different points. So they are not, uh, they don't go into coincidence. And the anomaly appears only when uh, actually all the points of a correlator collapse. Okay, they have to, so they are ultra local terms. In fact, uh, um, the ordinary so the solution of the conformal world identity that uh, uh, constrains such correlators have always been split into two parts originally, for instance, by Osborne and Pecco. In the solution of the world identities for different points when the points are separated, and then on top of that, one adds an extra contribution um, where you, know, you consider the contribution of uh, um, coming when, when the point go, go into coincidence. That's the way the anomaly is introduced. So it's introduced by end. In momentum space, this is, comes naturally. And so uh, once we have an anomaly, the anomaly comes because of renormalization. Then what we want to do is we want to um, compute the complete anomaly effective action. And um, this is pretty complicated, of course. And people have been trying mm, in various ways to do it and um, with partial success, I would say, because uh, it's a difficult. And one approach uh, consists in uh, working directly in, uh, in coordinate space, sorry, momentum space, but in flat, in the flat space time limit. I try to identify this anomaly effective action and uh, by direct computation. Of course, the limitation of the computations are all there because you cannot go beyond three or four point functions and so on. It gets very difficult. But uh, what I'm gonna show is uh, the analysis of four point functions allow us to uh, to compare, let's say, exact computation around uh, uh, using amplitudes in flat space with uh, the solution of, uh, I would call it uh, uh, functional equation, which is the anomaly equation, right? So anomaly induced action solve this functional relation, but uh, they miss also terms, okay? And there are some very famous uh, uh, effective actions, functionals have been computed, they've been derived already uh, several years ago, several decades ago. And it's still unclear whether they are uh, correct or not. And we are gonna show actually, in the last transpiration, we're gonna show that there is something that needs to be added to this action in order to make them consistent with the perturbative result, okay. So um, let me uh, first introduce my collaborators, Sarah Matteo Maglio is a senior collaborator with in Adelberg. Um, and then graduate student Mario Creti, Stefano Leonetti, uh, Riccardo Tommasi, who is uh, a very well-known guitar player, am I right? And uh, I haven't um, identified all the references because there are so many, but I can uh, uh, actually refer to work by Barvinsky, Giannotti and Mottola, then Shapiro, uh, Manuela Sorey, Zoski, McFadden, and Skenderis for the part on uh, on the amplitude in uh, momentum space, the tensorial amplitude. There is recent work also by Caloro, like my father, and I won't be able to, to say much about it. Um, and then there is the work we did with uh, Matteo and uh, other work also with previous uh, students of mine, um, Luigi Velerosi, you know, a professor in, in uh, Cosenza. Uh, sorry, here I, I wrote Maxim, Maxim. <laughs> 
Maxim, Karl Steiner, uh, Rina Ankevich, uh, Maria Vosmediano, these are a colleague that work, uh, we, work at inter we, we are interfaced with these colleagues for what concerns the application of uh, confirmed field theory momentum space in the context of condensed metal physics. Okay, so I will try to first give a brief introduction to modified gravity, which is uh, one of the reasons why we do also this stuff. And um, what does it, what happens when we have a conformal sector and we introduce, uh, um, we have gravity in the background. So the integration of this conformal sector actually um, causes the emergence of uh, the conformal anomaly and uh, eventually also the chiral anomaly if uh, uh, the, uh, in some cases. And um, there are constraints that we can, uh, uh, we can use from conformal symmetry to let's say match the computation in, in, in flat space from with those in curved space time. Then I will talk a little bit about anomaly induced actions, their limitations. I won't say much because of lack of time. And um, maybe I will say also something about uh, some open issues concerning uh, renormalization in curved space time, especially dimensional regularization. As you know, there are issues concerning the structure of anomalies. Um, you know, there has been a statement by various people that there should be additional anomalies called the B anomalies, uh, coming from the fact that uh, certain theory should be really the counter term, so a conformal theory should be computed in curved space time. This is a source of uh, still of debate, it's not settled at all at this point. And there are also uh, arguments to say that probably this is not true. Okay, so, um, and then I will talk about the perturbative test and possible resolutions and conclusion. So let me come uh, uh, to the main point. Why do we do this, right? Uh, from a phenomenological point of view, as you know, right, the discovery of gravitational waves, we are, um, we have the possibility to test the gravity. Now, all the gravitational uh, effects that have been tested so far, I would say pretty successfully, concern the merging of black holes or uh, neutron stars, and, uh, but the hope is that we might be able, maybe in the future, to detect also the stochastic uh, background of gravitational waves. And this would bring us very close to, let's say, to the, the beginning of, uh, of time in our universe. And uh, now to do the analysis of gravitational waves in general, you would be needing just the GR. I mean, very sophisticated application with codes and so on, numerical codes, but essentially just GR. And uh, this is done, of course, uh, by um, using uh, the Einstein-Hilbert action that you see, you see here. And the coupling to metal is actually, can be linearized through the stress energy tensor of metal. And uh, the, now, of course, uh, um, if, uh, if we move away from the Planck, uh, uh, from the Planck scale, then, uh, as you know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, massive scales that are introduced, right? I mean, the first fraction, the first second of uh, the, early, the early universe, you will see uh, a theory that goes from, you know, let's say quantum gravity to, um, to let's say a scale of grand unification, then eventually the weak scale and then the, the standard model. And uh, for that, of course, uh, there are variants that you need to introduce. Uh, of course, this uh, description, conformal description is definitely not sufficient. But close to the Planck scale, we expect that um, conformal symmetry should play an important role. If you want to describe uh, the late uh, uh, evolution of the universe, then conformal symmetry again comes back. And uh, as you know, there is a problem of the cosmological constant. And um, conformal symmetry might be able, has been uh, discussed by several authors, might be able to solve this problem. Um, essentially, um, by referring to Toft naturalness principle, because conformal symmetry could control actually the cosmological constant and could avoid uh, that it gets very, uh, it gets large. Okay, cosmological constant is important for the late time uh, acceleration. And uh, you know that we need also dark energy to describe the rotation curves of stars in the galaxies. So uh, einstein Hilbert has to be modified at some level, uh, either by matter or by modifying uh, let's say with additional extra matter, or eventually, uh, if you believe in mound theories, modifying Newtonian dynamics, then things get even more uh, complicated. 
So, but the basic principle is that many people believe that the gravity should be, needs to be modified at some level. And some of these modifications can be induced by quantum corrections and that these are the ones we are gonna discuss today. Now, uh, what kind of corrections there are? There are corrections which are quadratic in curvature, like for instance, in Starbinsky model um, that was introduced to solve the graceful exit problem in inflation. Or for instance, there are, uh, let's say more sophisticated correction like the one introduced by Stell in order to have a renormalizable and, but unfortunately not unitary theory of, uh, of gravity. And then there are the uh, well-known F of R so-called modifications in, uh, in various guises. I mean, uh, uh, people have discussed in several, uh, several papers, hundreds of papers, this modification. So gravity is very rich. I mean, we could modify, uh, we, we find a lot of solutions and so on. It's different from gauge theories. So, uh, because the interactions go to all orders. So that's, that's the basic reason. And uh, uh, when uh, we look at the partner patterns of modification, you can have, for instance, here I'm uh, borrowing from uh, um, a report by the Cantasa network. Uh, from general relativity, you get the new fields and you go into tensor, vector, scalar, Teves, so-called theory of gravity. And then we have a plethora of uh, a possible extensions with Tessens, Ordesky, Beyond Ordesky, Brandsdicki, Galileons, and so on. Really, it's a, it's a, it's a zoo of uh, possible modifications. And uh, other modifications uh, are obtained by adding invariants. For instance, you can add uh, Arminio square or the other combinations of uh, uh, the Riemann tensor and so on and so forth. And um, you can use, uh, for instance, uh, lower log types of theories, which tell you in any dimension, what kind of uh, extension are possible that preserve uh, second order equation of motion and so on, conformal violence and so on and so forth. And then there is uh, another class of modifications which are more drastic, where actually you go into non Riemannian geometries and I won't consider at all these theories because I'm not an expert, first of all, and second, because I find them a little bit, uh, uh, let's say a little bit farther away from possible tests, but it's, this doesn't mean that we cannot have a torsion. Eh? I mean, it's possible, but there are uh, groups that are working on that, just not an expert. Um, and uh, one of the, the reason for doing this type of uh, work is also connected with the new uh, proposal. There are two proposals as far as I know from the Netherlands and Sardinia in Italy by NFN for the construction of the Einstein telescope. And so we are people working on gravity really find that it's, it's now time to, uh, to, 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 to deal with these issues that before we had not been considered. And um, in fact, uh, INFN is hiring. Uh, a few days ago, I actually got the news that they are hiring at least in the technological sector. So it's very important also for the future of the field. Now, um, all these modifications I've been uh, referring to before, they don't talk about uh, the inclusion of quantum corrections. Essentially, you start from gravity, you just modify gravity in some fashion, okay? But there is a, uh, another point of view, which is uh, in a sense uh, more natural, right? Which uh, consists in uh, the introduction of a uh, matter sector. And you can assume, for instance, that gravity is a pure background and uh, uh, let uh, uh, this matter sector run in, in the loops. Now, this has been done, of course, in the past, as well known. It's not, I don't call it quantum gravity, but it would be semi-classical gravity because uh, you are actually seeing the impact or if you want, uh, yeah, it's an effective action that accounts for matter. And this is represented by this type of uh, diagrams that I will show all the way in my talk. And uh, uh, you can actually start with no metric at all and uh, let this, uh, this metric be arbitrary and introduce a sector which is not necessarily conformal in the loops, then you will be able with some, some analysis to actually discover that you generate both a cosmological constant, you the Einstein-Hilbert term, and also quadratic correction to gravity. Now, uh, you could couple, of course, uh, this type of uh, theory to ordinary matter. So you'd have a matter, let's say, a double phase, matter that goes inside the loops, gravity is, gra gravity is external, and uh, the integration over uh, this sector will give you quadratic uh, correction to gravity. But then you can also couple ordinary matter, let's say, not quantum, but classical, to this type of action. 
And um, the computation are pretty straightforward. Just, uh, I think I will skip this part, but uh, just to give you an idea, I mean, essentially you can take, for instance, a scalar and uh, running inside the loops, you uh, people have been using in the past the it, it kernel methods to compute this effective action. Usually this effective action need the regularization. You can see here that there is a cutoff of one over k square k as the dimension of length and is essentially connected with the Planck scale. And uh, once you uh, you integrate out, uh, um, let's say massive method, ordinary method, then there are techniques that people have developed along the years, like the, the, the bit Schwinger expansion and, uh, and they've been able for various types of fields and so on and so forth to identify the contribution to the effective action. So depending on the type of matter that you let run inside the loops, you get a certain effective action. One important thing is that uh, when you do this type of calculation, usually you compare two metric, let's say a fiducial metric and uh, another metric, okay? So uh, now what is the problem with this computation? Well, uh, the problem is essentially this k to the power four, right? I mean, uh, you, you find essentially a hierarchy problem because uh, um, the, the computations are not uh, um, are connected with the plan scale. And we know that the cosmological constant is uh, extremely small. So um, we face the usual problem of uh, naturalness. And, uh, but by using this technique uh, and uh, that people have been using in the past, I mean, you can actually, this expression, I, uh, this, expression this effective action can be, can be rewritten in, in some form, for instance, in terms of the wild tensor square, the square, the cosmological term, the, um, the, 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 uh, the uh, einstein Hilbert action plus a square plus method. And you can see also uh, through renormalization, you can actually, here we are just regulating the theory, but you will see, you can study the running, somehow the running of the parameters of this action as we change, uh, as change the scale K and uh, uh, depending also on the mass of the particle that run in the loops. So uh, let's come to conformal symmetry. Why do we want conformal matter to run in the loops? I mean, is there a reason why we want to do that? Well, uh, conformal symmetry is a, it's an infinite dimensional symmetry in two dimensions. In four dimension is a finite dimensional. And uh, you can try to constrain actually this effective action if you have a conformal symmetry. This is from the mathematical point of view. From the physical point of view, the use of conformal symmetry and um, a conformal matter in the loops uh, is related, I, as I was mentioning uh, before, to various uh, properties and uh, hints that come from uh, uh, both from phenomenology and from theory that conformal symmetry should play an important role, for instance, to describe also uh, dark energy. And uh, beside, I mean, you know that you know, the, the string scale, I mean, conformal symmetry on the, on the world sheet is an important symmetry that gives uh, consistency to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to string theory. So this uh, uh, symmetry is reduced, becomes 15, uh, has 15 generators in four dimension, which are the translation, the rotation, the dilatation, and the special conformal transformation. Can be formulated also in terms of ortho orthogonal generators in the, as you can see here with this redefinition. Now, uh, if you have a conformal field theory, then you have, uh, of course, you have primary fields, you have all the paraphernalia of this type of theories, you have dilatation, uh, word identities, the fixed these correlators, the constraint, I would say, special conformal uh, uh, word identities also, with the scalar part and the spin part, they are pretty complicated. But people have done a lot of work, of course, in the last, uh, in the second half of last century, and uh, they're still doing, of course, to, to fix this correlation function as much as they can through conformal blocks and the consistency conditions and so on and so forth, the operator plot expansion. And uh, up to three point functions, conformal field theory is very powerful in coordinate space. You can fix, for instance, uh, if you have some primary operators and it's given scaling dimension, basically you can, you can fix, uh, um, you can determine the structure of the uh, three point function. If you go to uh, four point function, then uh, you have these invariant ratios that appear. And they've been investigated kind of recently in momentum space by McFadden, Skenderis, and Zosky. Now, the other ingredient, important ingredient in this analysis are anomalies, okay? You all know about anomalies, anomalies in the standard model, uh, anomalies in physics, uh, Carroll anomalies, cancellation, engagement theories. So they give consistency 
to uh, to engage with theory. We, we, we break renormalizability if you don't have a, a cancellation of the anomalies. And um, uh, the statement is that uh, this type of diagrams, once you factorize the charges in front, are identically zero. And uh, usually what we do is we cancel the anomalies in exact phase of gauge theory, and then we forget about it. I mean, uh, the theory remains anomaly free and consistent. And the typical example of the kind of anomaly is, uh, for instance, a model where you have a vector, an axial vector current. This is a uh, uh, gauge theory. And of course, uh, there are inconsistencies, but you could consider a theory with an external, let's say, global uh, symmetry uh, in the sense that it's not propagating this field B mu. Then uh, the theory is essentially consistent as an anomaly. And uh, it's important, for instance, in the context of uh, in various contexts, but uh, more recently also in uh, topological insulators, there is an uh, important activity that is developing uh, also with some colleagues that they've written. Maria Vosmediano, Kamban Steiner, and um, Maxim Chernodub and other colleagues have written a very good review uh, on the role of anomalies, conformal and Carroll in the context of uh, topological insulators. And, uh, you know, usually uh, if you take any textbook, these anomalies are computing by using Fujigawa's method. Now, uh, basically the measure is, as you know, is not invariant under a certain local Carroll transformation while the, the action is. And so uh, that generates uh, the contribution of the anomaly. And uh, let's say the axial vector carrier becomes anomalous and this anomaly in, uh, can be written at least in the abelian cases E dot B, if you consider uh, at least for a model like this. Now uh, you can do a similar derivation also the conformal anomaly, but you have to stick to D equal four. This was done by Fujikawa in the, in the 70s. But if you use the measure regularization, it is something that happens. You don't see the anomaly emerging from the measure of integration because uh, uh, it doesn't get uh, uh, an extra term if you stay away from D equal four. You will see that the anomaly comes from the counter terms. This is a very subtle point that um, we have figured out only recently. Um, but as I said, the anomalies come from ultra local regions and they can be global or local. But an important point is that some of them are topological, others are not. So uh, when an anomaly is topological, you basically don't have renormalization. In, uh, so for instance, in, um, if you take the, let's say axial anomaly, the usual axial anomaly, then what you find is that you don't need to regulate the diagram. You just need to impose the word identity to get the anomaly. You can do it through a regularization, but eventually it's the word identity that fixes, uh, fixes the anomaly. So, um, and that, that is the signature essentially that the anomaly is topological. The same happens also for the E contribution, E where E is the Euler Poincare density in the conformal anomaly. Uh, because in that case, E is actually a topological term in D equal four and, uh, uh, and uh, is actually not a counter term in the, in the renormalization of the effective action. Uh, the real counter term is a Val tensor square. But in that case, uh, things are more complicated. So you have both a topological contribution, which is the E contribution to the anomaly, and C square, the Val tensor square, is non topological. Okay, so, um, so as I said, if you want to see anomalies appear in correlation function, then you have to go to momentum space. And the, there has been work uh, in the recent years in trying to uh, describe correlation functions. Uh, um, solve the conformal word identity momentum space. Now, as I was telling you before, these are the dilatation word identity. These are the special conformal word identities. Their solutions are non-trivial, and but they, they can be pursued autonomously in, uh, in momentum space, exactly as uh, in coordinate space uh, people have done in the past. Now, people have asked me, but why don't you Fourier transform a result <laughs> that is known already in coordinate space? Because in coordinate space, sometimes it's much easier to solve, right? And uh, you don't have to solve differential. Uh, difficult differential equation. There is a formalism that's been developed along the years that allows you to solve the, the determine this constraint, to solve the constraint quite immediately, I would say. But momentum space, you have to solve differential equations, uh, really. And uh, this is non-trivial. Now, uh, the reason is that uh, if you the Fourier transform from direct, from um, uh, position space, you don't get anywhere. I tried to do that, actually. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on that. Then I realized that basically, you don't get anywhere because you don't see any pattern. And um, so people have been uh, trying in various uh, 
various ways to get information about the conformal theory and momentum space. For instance, our approach we also, with Luigi Delle Rose, Emil, uh, also Nottola, Mirko Serino, and later with Matteo and um, uh, young collaborators has been to, um, let's say, try to, from, from, from uh, free field theory, try to, to see whether there was a, a way to understand the emergence of anomalies. Because in free field theory, uh, you know, free field theory is essentially conformal field theory. You can have fermion, scalar, conformally coupled, scalar, and equal four. You can have a spin one running in the loops. And you could analyze the correlation function directly. In the scalar case, uh, uh, we were able many years ago to, um, to show that actually conformal word identity could be exactly solved for three point function, scalar three point function. Uh, two weeks later, actually, uh, a major paper came out by Bzoski, McFadden, and Skenderis, and then continued this activity. They continued in several papers that followed up uh, where they actually uh, developed a technique, a method, uh, which is a pretty general, allows you to um, to split the conformal word identities in a, in a certain fashion. And this is going to be very important for, for our purposes in the identification test of the effective action that we're going to do in the next, uh, in the next uh, transparencies. Um, so the analysis that was mostly focused on simpler correlators, in our case at least, the TJJ, the TTT, and so on. And then eventually, um, let's say we, we use this, uh, we have used this method in, in uh, let's say, from the point of view of free field theory, in order to uh, to move also to four point functions. As you know, um, the solution four point function is more complicated, as I was telling you before, respect to three point function, because conformal field theory is not uh, doesn't fix anything, everything, but it does fix almost everything in the case up to three point functions. In fact, uh, for instance, in D equal four, uh, well, this was already known from the work of uh, Osborne and Petku. Uh, in coordinate space, but I mean, uh, has been independently derived by Zoski, McFadden, and Skenderis in their work. Um, and with Matteo Maggio, uh, with Matteo, we try to reproduce this work by using free field theory with the idea of simplifying the results uh, we, which uh, had been presented. In fact, you get uh, a complete uh, uh, description, at least for some correlators like the TJJ or the TTT or uh, uh, the perturbative uh, description is completely equivalent to, um, let's say, to the non-perturbative one, if you want to call it, or the one coming from the solution, formal solution of the conformal word identities. But in order to do that, you need to take a, an arbitrary number of scalars, uh, fermions, or spin one, but there is a way to match the uh, constant of integration that comes from the solution of the conformal word identities in the tensorial case with, uh, um, with the, the results from perturbation theory. Okay, so um, three-point functions uh, were, for instance, uh, derived by us in this in this combination of uh, hypergeometric uh, functions for uh, in terms of ratio of momenta. Then they were simplified by, I mean, I would say mostly at the same time, they were working independently by Bzolski, McFadden, and Skenderis using these triple K integrals. Essentially, triple K integral is equivalent to a linear combination of these four uh, upper functions that uh, we found in the literature, very old literature. And uh, basically in the, in the work of uh, uh, Skenderian collaborators, this, uh, this computation of course has been extended to the tensor case. Now, when we, uh, in the effective action, for us all this discussion is relevant for the effective action. The effective action, when we want to, um, to integrate uh, conformal sector, then uh, we are computing actually, so we, we switch now to free field theory because uh, if we want to look at four point functions and see what happens uh, um, from a physical point of view, well, we could wait until people have developed more general methods, uh, let's say uh, solving in more general way the conform word identities, but really uh, from the physical point of view, at least uh, um, for those who are interested in seeing, for instance, application to gravity, we should run fast at the moment. So uh, let's say using free field theory is convenient and uh, it provides a realization. So not the most general one, but a, a realization which is complete of, uh, so we can compute essentially this type of diagrams. So what we have to do is we have to uh, let uh, conformal, conformal degrees of freedom run inside the loops. And we try to do the same decomposition that was done for three point function extended to four point function. This is what we have done in the last, uh, let's say two, three years. 
and um, trying to uh, to connect, let's say, the effective action. You see, if I if these are gravitational lines, so uh, the background is generic. Okay. Now, if I expand this effective action around uh, around flat space time, then the coefficient of this effective action are the correlation functions that have been discussed before. So there is a connection between the effective action computed around the flat background with the correlation functions that are identified in uh, conformal field theory in flat space time. So if you want, uh, the effective action is the in some sense the generative function of, of all these uh, conformal field theories. Now, uh, we stick, of course, with the, with the effective actions that are generated uh, from a partition function, right? That's, what, that's why we go to free field theory. And we have uh, complete control, at least around flex space, of these correlation functions if you do a perturbative expansion. This is, the, this is the idea. Now, when we compute uh, these things, we have to be a little bit careful. I mean, you know, there, is a, there are divergences you have to regulate, although we are one loop, right? The divergence is actually a single pole in one over d minus four. And uh, um, so, for instance, you get the simplest case is when you let uh, a scalar field, uh, conformally coupled scalar, in this case, chi in d equal four should be one six. Then you, um, then you, get, uh, you get a conformal theory. And uh, what you do, essentially you compute loops with the insertion of the perturbative, uh, that we call, would call the stress energy tensor of the free field uh, realization. And um, so we start with, the, with an action which is defined more simply in terms of uh, um, a partition function, which is defined in terms of an action which is conformal invariant. We take the log of this partition function to generate all the one particle reducible diagram with the number uh, arbitrary number of gravitons, and uh, we take the log. By taking the log, um, then uh, we are taking the log of the, uh, the functional integral, but we have divergences, of course, right, formally. And these divergences need to be regulated. Now, what we know historically is that uh, these diagrams are regulated to all orders just by two counterterms. They are very famous in the community, which is the Euler point carrier density is about tensor square. These are the only two counterterms which are needed in four dimension in order to, to, if you are in six dimension, of course, there are more, okay? For D equals six, there are papers by, I think Shapiro, probably also Manela Soray, and um, there is paper also mine a few years ago. Um, so let's say that the formalism can be uh, extended, but in, in D equal four, these are the two counterterms which are needed now. You have to be careful a little bit in the literature because there are people claiming that you need more general forms of counterterms. Um, I won't get into that. There is a, we are working on a paper trying to clarify this point. I don't think really that um, that point of view is uh, uh, is needed because what you see is even if you take a theory which is non-conformal, let's say spin one theories are non-conformal away from D equal four. Um, you see from the pattern, at least if you are around flat space, that um, this uh, breaking of, uh, which is not anomalous or the conformal word identities is not relevant for the renormalization in D equal four. So it's not clear whether you really need these uh, uh, value invariant counterterms that people talk about. If you stay in four dimension, you take four dimensional uh, value invariant counterterms, uh, then, uh, then, uh, you, then you're fine to regulate the singularities. Now, uh, can you extend this analysis from simple scalar theories to more complicated theories? Yes, you can. You can e even take the standard model and uh, which becomes conformal, by the way, if you, uh, in, a standard, in a standard gravitation on the ground, if you remove the masses of the X sector and uh, at least at one loop, I mean. And uh, this analysis has been done in the past, uh, did it with Luigi uh, De La Rosa and Mirko Serino. The computation are of course uh, very, are cumbersome. You don't see the Gantter terms I was mentioning before because the sector at least that we discussed was a sector with spin one uh, in the standard lines, like a graviton photon photon in the standard model, in a complete electroweak theory. And it works. I mean, essentially, uh, renormalization in a flat space time is sufficient to renormalize also uh, in a curved space time the, around the flat space time limit if the X is, con is, uh, is conformally coupled. That's something we verified. Okay, so if this is interesting, it's, it is as if uh, the, um, the, the, the in, some, in some sense, the standard model knows of gravity, but uh, uh, if you want, you can interpret this result in that way. Um, 
so um okay so as i was saying uh, going back uh, uh, to what i was saying before this uh, effective action can be expanded and um, expanded in terms of correlation functions and these correlation functions are correlation functions stress energy density so um, concerning the counter terms and the regularization of this expansion as i was telling you before there is the other point carry density and the wild tensor square you can define in d dimension four dimension the difference if you um, choose for instance c square in d or in four dimension is a term which is uh, uh, box of R. Box of R is so it contributes to the anomaly, as we say, in a local way, and uh, is prescription dependent. So uh, you can find, uh, uh, you know, in the as a counter term, as a square, this version of C square, the Val tensor square, or in uh, the D dimensional version. And uh, for the other point carry density, this is the this is the expression. Now, an interesting thing of these uh, counter terms, at least. Uh, when we, we do what people call the conformal decomposition. In other words, we take the metric and we split it into some fiducial metric, which keep fixed. And then we, we vary this uh, dilaton. I, people call it also conformal, or I prefer to call it dilaton. Um, this dilaton uh, from uh, respect to the fiducial metric, then you have very, uh, uh, some rescaling uh, uh, formulas, which uh, if you are at, uh, in four dimension, basically go back to an expression found by by Reigert and was used in his uh, computation of the effective action. If you stay away from the equal four, then it gets a little bit more complicated. Okay, but the interesting thing is that if you if you want to find the trace anomaly, you can actually use this uh, uh, conformal decomposition and then uh, uh, vary what you get respect to phi, taking a variation respect to phi is equivalent to differential respect to the metric and taking a trace. So it's equivalent to take essentially a trace of stress energy tensor, okay? So that's, uh, this is a, a very important, simple trick, well-known in the field that people use in order to, uh, to compute effective action. Now, another important element when you do this conformal decomposition is a, a concept of value invariance. Value invariance is a statement that you take a functional if you take a function of the metric, it's value invariant if you do multiply the metric by some local uh, exponential of the form two tau of x, tau of x is generic, and still the function stays the same. That's value invariant. So when the function satisfies this condition is value invariant. And uh, now value invariance in, uh, in curved space time, the effective action actually, uh, uh, well, basically requires that you have some uh, uh, conformal Killing vectors uh, for the metric. And if you go into a local free falling frame, essentially tells you that you should have, uh, uh, if the, the action is well invariant, then you should have, uh, um, let's say, uh, con the ordinary conformal invariant uh, uh, theory. Okay, so uh, but invariance uh, is in a way is an abelian symmetry, but you have to be careful because of these uh, uh, tau of x can be, you know, can be expanded to be arbitrary in order in x. So what is telling you uh, this constraint is that uh, if you have value invariance, you go in a, in a let's say in the tangent space, uh, then uh, in the locally flat limit, then actually this quantity has to be at most uh, quadratic in, in X. So there are the 15 uh, generators and uh, the 15 generators of the, of the theory, the symmetry. Uh, now, what the renormalization does? The renormalization does in the, in the effective action, what it does is to introduce uh, counter terms and uh, the variation, uh, sorry, the counter terms introduce a breaking of this wild symmetry. These, uh, uh, they have a structure, they are identified by several computations. And uh, uh, you require in general that this action, if you do two variations respect to tau and tau prime or tau prime and tau, satisfies the well zoomino consistency condition. Once you do that, this uh, uh, quadratic invariance actually gets organized in terms of the other point carry density the uh, Val tensor square and box of R. So in this way, you have, uh, um, you have generated, let's say, an effective action, um, the anomaly, right? So the variation, the Val variation in curved space time gives you the anomaly, okay? So um, it's, uh, as you can see, is related to the gravitational, uh, is a gravitational effect. If you add also, for instance, uh, spin one fields, then you would have also contribution in the variation, which is uh, proportional to F square, the field strength square. And the reason is that you'd have a counter term 
which is not just given by um, by vc square and v, you'd be getting also the f square term. Okay, to renormalize. Now uh, it's interesting that if you uh, now the question is, uh, can I compute effective action uh, completely in this form? Just or for instance, another thing I could try to do is uh, my renormalized action. My I started with a with a bare effective action. Then I said, well, look, there is a counter term that I have, I have to add. Now, this counter term, I can, I can play this game. I can actually introduce the counter term. So this one plus SB gives me the renormalized action. But then I sum uh, the same counter term in a certain fiducial metric, and then I subtract it. So I don't change anything. This is still a renormalized action. Then what I do is I take the limit for D going to four, essentially epsilon going to zero. And what I realize is that uh, this, uh, um, uh, this renormalized action is split into two parts, as we're going to see. And there is a contribution that appears, which is uh, uh, the, basically the counter terms, one piece of the counter term has been, uh, has been removed, essentially this term. But you will be getting something finite. Essentially, this limit is finite. And we'll see what we get. Well, we'll get essentially normalized action in four dimension, which is given by uh, what people call a wet zoomino term, which is uh, what is left from the counter term once you do this redefinition I was mentioning uh, here. Okay, this one you can do both for C square and for the topological density. And uh, plus, uh, uh, there would be a term which is, uh, would you say, wide invariant. In other words, if you take, uh, if you do the value variation, or you, if you want, you take the energy momentum tensor and the trace of this uh, renormalized action. This contribution, this will not contribute to a trace anomaly, and this will generate the entire trace anomaly. So the trace anomaly is uh, attributed to this contribution, which is uh, vile variant. In other words, the variation with respect to phi is non-zero for this term, and this is uh, vile invariant. Okay, but in uh, dimensional regularization, this contribution is entirely coming from the counter term, and this is one of the reasons why uh, this is different from what happens, for instance, in four dimension. If you use a cutoff regularization as Fujikawa did for the derived anomaly, because in that case, you can see they come from the functional measure. I don't see any, uh, any anomaly appearing from this term if I stay in D dimension and I take a conformal sector. If I don't take a conformal factor, conformal sectors, same story, because, uh, um, well, this is a very fine detail, but uh, uh, essentially a conformal, the, the, the breaking of conformal symmetry uh, due to the fact we are going away from D equal four is not related to the anomaly. The anomaly is really a four dimensional phenomenon. Okay, there are, I would have to uh, go delve into more details for that. I don't have time to do that. But in any case, the trace of the stress energy tensor that is generated in the quantum level is connected with these contributions. If you have also spin one, you have F square, then uh, this uh, combination E minus two third box R. Box R is uh, uh, this term comes from, you can include in the anomaly also an R square term and uh, you can remove it. I mean, it's prescription dependent. This is a traditional way of writing essentially uh, the anomaly. This is what people call the, uh, the topological part. This is the non-topological part. Now, one other thing I want to say is that uh, uh, the VE counter term is not really a counter term. It's a misnomer to call it a counter term because uh, it's a term which in four dimension is evanescent because it's topological. So if you compute in four dimension, the integral of square root of G times E, you get uh, uh, you differentiate, you get zero respect to the metric, okay? Because it's topological, but um, uh, it's still is required as I was mentioning uh, before by the wet zoomino consistency condition. So the three invariants that appear in the breaking of value invariants due to renormalization, actually because of the wet zoomino consistency condition, let E appear. So we call it a counter term. Now, um, can we compute effective action? Yes, you can compute effective action. If, let's say you use, uh, uh, you expand your counter terms and uh, you go to D dimension. Um, well, you should specify also uh, your metric in D dimension, they go to D equal four. It's very subtle and the procedure is not unique. But in general, uh, this type of uh, approach has been used, for instance, in two dimension. You know, in two dimension, um, the Einstein Gaussian the Einstein term is uh, the equivalent to the Gaussian name for dimension. In other words, it's topological, and so people have generated by using uh, 
you know, by taking square root of g times r divided by epsilon, where epsilon is the d minus two. By doing this limit, this term is not evanescent, evanescent anymore and gives a form of uh, what people call, I think, real gravity or in any case, dilaton gravity in uh, two dimension. And you can do the same, of course, in equal four. You end up with uh, a dilaton form of gravity where uh, this is an anomaly action where you have uh, quart, which is quartic in the dilaton field. Okay, now you have to be careful because this action is computed in a certain uh, regularization scheme and you need to be also uh, precise concerning the integration over the extra dimension, how to you extend your metric from four to the dimension and so on and so forth. Okay, but you can get, uh, you know, uh, effective actions which generate anomaly and um, they contain a dilaton. So these are form of dilaton gravities. Recently, there has been a lot of interest, especially in the gauss bonnet term, just by itself, right? Uh, the, Einstein the Einstein gravity is the only action uh, that according to Lovelock generates the Lovelock theorems in four dimension generates second order equation of motion. People have tried to introduce a gauss bonnet term exactly as in this case, basically with one over epsilon in front and, and take the epsilon go to D to four or epsilon go to zero limit in order to generate variants of gravity where you have um, uh, that they call for the Einstein Gauss Bonnet gravity. So is the, let's say the, the ordinary Gauss Bonnet, but not just, uh, you know, the D equal four Gauss Bonnet is purely topological, so it has no meaning. Uh, but if you uh, take the limit from D, let's say different from four, you divide by one over D minus four, then you get um, this contribution is finite. Okay, now let me, then I have more or less 10 minutes. And the last 10 minutes, I would say something concerning uh, these anomaly actions computed not from the perturbative point of view, but uh, uh, let's say uh, solving uh, a functional equation. Oh, now, uh, what is the functional equation? A functional equation you can see is this one. And uh, T mu mu is a two G mu nu times the functional derivative of some function, functional respect to the metric. And so you want to define this function. You want to, to get this functional by solving this uh, uh, functional equation. Now, how do you do that? Well, uh, the one possibility is actually, as I was mentioned before, to expand your counter terms. And, uh, but you will get into this kind of dilaton gravity with a quartic, uh, quartic dilaton. Now, uh, is this, uh, this an effective action? Yes, this is an effective action. It might be useful, for instance, up to a certain scale uh, when uh, where the uh, you know the dilaton has to be uh, here has no dimension so you need to normalize it and so you would see a scale appearing in this type of in this type of analysis and uh, you can say that as i go however in the ultraviolet then uh, there shouldn't be any scale appearing the effective action and then i should try to solve uh, for the effective action uh, or the anomaly induced action, because this, uh, this is a function that solves only the anomaly constraint, is not a complete computation of the partition function. I should be able to uh, expand in some scaleless, uh, with some scaleless variable. And this scaleless variable actually uh, is R times one over box. Okay, so um, and it appears in, in many, uh, many versions in the recent literature in non-local gravity. Now, uh, the effective action is solved uh, essentially by introducing a, a special operator. You see a certain operator appears. This operator appears from the rescaling of the euler poincare density. Well, more precisely, the euler poincare density is minus two third box of R. And this was done by Regert long ago. Is uh, uh, This operator is uh, kind of is a special property because it's a uh, conformally covariant. So, um, uh, when it acts on scalars, basically on uh, 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 entities which are scalar under vial uh, transformations, then basically if you do a vial uh, transformation on the metric, the operator uh, remains the same. And uh, you can solve for the effective action. Now, I don't have time to go through the formalism, but essentially the, uh, the action which uh, solves this, uh, this constraint can be determined in this form. Now, uh, one is to be a little bit careful because it looks like a local action, but it's not a local action. So there will be this uh, um, uh, Panitz operator, as it is called in four dimension, but there will be also this quantity sigma, which is actually the dilaton. In other words, what you do is you can solve for the dilaton. 
So there is a way, if you stay in four dimensions, to remove the dilaton. So what is the connection between these theories and theories where the dilaton, which is sigma r, has been removed? Well, uh, it's not clear. I mean, uh, this is a solution that is performed uh, by going uh, away from d equal four and then to d equal four in a certain fashion. And uh, you find this uh, quartic uh, uh, effective action, which is an anomaly action, but you could uh, um, solve uh, just uh, in a different way as Rager did, uh, by looking the scaling uh, properties of the Euler point current density and the divide tensor square, basically the counter terms. And the solution is given here, okay? I don't have time to go through that, but the literature, uh, there is a, a very, there is a huge literature on this, uh, on this type of stuff. So what you can see is that uh, this sigma is, uh, is actually non-local, right? It's a non-local expression because there is the Green's function of this operator appearing in the solution. And this is essentially one contribution of the anomaly. The other contribution is a square. Another uh, yeah, contribution is F square. So if you, uh, let's say you want to consider from this action, you would like to generate, for instance, endpoint uh, functions of uh, gravitons in flat space, what you should do is you should differentiate this respect to, to the metric n times and then set the metric to be delta or eta, you know, go to flat space. And you get the prediction for the correlation function. Now, what do you predict in this way? Well, you predict a correlation function that satisfies the anomaly constraint, but you don't compute the entire correlation function of the anomaly effective action. You see, so the idea of this action is to be able to generate a part of the correlation function, but to all orders, you see, I should be able to differentiate these to all orders. So without doing any computation, by solving a variational uh, variational problem, being able to, this is the normal induced action, it should be able to uh, compute to identify all the pieces which are um, driven by the anomaly in this correlation function. Now, is it true? That's the point. The answer is what we have found, it's not, it's not true. In other words, uh, uh, this is a paper that will appear this week, uh, uh, probably with uh, Matteo uh, Maggio and uh, Riccardo Tommasi. And uh, essentially, what we have done, and uh, I try to, uh, in the last five minutes, to tell you what is the result of this analysis, which is interesting, but opens up uh, uh, a lot of new, um, uh, lot of issues, several issues, because these, ac these actions, these actions have been used extensively, and uh, what we find is that uh, the correlation functions that are generated from uh, from this type of action do not satisfy the constraint that we get from the perturbative analysis. So we have performed the perturbative analysis for one correlator, which is uh, not the 4T, the 4T is, uh, is more complicated and probably will be next on the list, but the TTJJ, okay? This is a correlator which is, uh, contains two graviton, two, uh, two conserved currents. And uh, the analysis has been done in uh, two gauges. Um, well, uh, you know, this expression is gauge independent, but as you introduce the expression of sigma, the dilaton in this, uh, in, well, one, one needs to know how it is derived, but essentially you need to perform a conformal decomposition, extract in this conformal decomposition phi, the dilaton, that here we call sigma in a certain fashion, and start from a certain fiducial metric, G bar. So depending on how you start to go from G to G from G bar, you will be getting different expression for sigma. This is the point. And um, for instance, one possibility is to define the dilaton uh, starting from a, a wild flat metric, which is what uh, Fratkin and Birkowski uh, did. And it's reviewed by Andrei Barvinsky, this, uh, this analysis. Now we uh, repeat the computation also for, uh, for the case of, uh, for this other gauge. And we did the perturbative expansion. So we are trying to see what this action predicts in two gauges for, uh, for, uh, um, for this type of correlators. These correlators have been computed in perturbation theory. So I would say exactly, because uh, we can compute around flat space. So what we should do is we should take this action, differentiate four times, right? Twice with respect to the gauge field, twice with respect to the, uh, to the metric, then set the metric to be flat and re remove, uh, uh, well, the gauge field disappear by itself. But in any case, you will, uh, um, you get the correlation function that is supposed to satisfy the same conformal word identities in flat space that we get from the perturbative analysis. Now, um, the answer is it doesn't. Why it doesn't? Well, 
uh, this is not clear at the moment, but uh, what we know is that, uh, and uh, so far you see this test has been done also by us up to three point functions. And there was perfect agreement um, uh, with, 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 with the Regers, uh, Regers action was done with Emil Motola. And uh, for four point functions in this analysis of four point function in this paper that is coming out, uh, there is also an analysis of the, uh, let's say three point functions. So for Fratkin and Wilkowski, which was, we hadn't done before, and also it satisfies all the constraints, all the conform word identity, the conservation word identities. And uh, uh, it doesn't as we move to four point functions. So what is the issue? At the moment, we don't know, but there is something that's missing in these actions. What are missing? Value invariant terms. In fact, value invariant terms are those uh, which are important are missing in this uh, discussion. And uh, we uh, realized some time ago, Matteo put a lot of effort into that. He realized that uh, uh, there was something missing in uh, uh, already at the level of the 40. Okay, the, the four point function of four stress energy tensor has not been computed completely in perturbation theory around flat space. But one of my former students, Mirko Serino, wrote uh, um, while he was postdoc at Ben Gurion University, I think, he, he, he did the computation for the scalar case. So we could use his results, which are available, and, uh, and do the computation using uh, Zosky McFadden's and uh, description to identify the part which is uh, in uh, an which generates anomaly in the four point function of the four T's. So even without a complete computation, it was possible to figure out that these correlation functions, okay, I mean, this correlation function can be renormalized in perturbation theory using, I mean, they have the bare definition plus the counter terms. The counter term part comes from these uh, two counter terms I was telling you before, VE and VC square. You can reorganize this expression. This is highly non-trivial for the algebra. Is very, the algebra is very lengthy. You need also computer programs to do that. But essentially you reorganize this combination as D goes to four in terms of a renormalized part and then an anomaly part, okay? So, uh, the renormalized part satisfies ordinary uh, conformal word identities without an anomaly. The anomaly part satisfies anomalous conformal word identities, and they are hierarchical. So, if I take, let's say, a trace word identities, I will project on three point functions which are also anomalous. If I take twice the trace of this quantity, I go to two point functions which have no trace anomaly, and so on and so forth. So, there is a kind of Matrioska type of uh, jerky that needs to be verified. They are exactly verified. Today it's possible to do this type of checks also with algebraic uh, manipulations, uh, uh, symbolic manipulation. So, uh, so we know that uh, uh, we could figure out uh, without knowing the complete expression of this quantity, but using uh, Mirko Serino computation, um, uh, materialized that there was this, uh, an extra term which was, uh, was needed that was called the zero residue. Now, this is a term which doesn't contribute to the trace, but should be part, uh, should be part of this anomaly. Okay, this anomaly contribution. So the, the pattern that emerges is the following. You have two quantities which are separately conserved. So perfectly consistent from the point of view of conservation of word identities. One satisfies correct anomaly free word identities. The other one satisfies word identities which are anomalous. So it's completely consistent. This term, is necessary and goes into this part because uh, otherwise it, there is no conservation of the um, of this structure. So the uh, conservation word identities are not satisfied. So we have conservation. We have all the word identity basically through the conservation word identity satisfied by the two pieces. Now, when you do the same analysis in the TTJJ, you verify a similar pattern and you realize that there is something missing in uh, um, that needs to be included. Uh, let's say in the anomaly action, because the anomaly action is supposed to generate for you all of this, and it doesn't. So it violates, it violates for the TTJJ, the, uh, the, conform, the anomalous conformal word identities, it violates the conservation word identities, which is, uh, which is as, as bad as you, uh, you want to think. Now, um, so what is the reason uh, for this? We are still investigating uh, and there should be other papers. Uh, I hope that the community also will intervene and maybe clarify some of the points uh, which uh, uh, result, uh, that result from this computation. But uh, um, so the structure that emerges in this anomaly part uh, is always the same one. I mean, essentially you have uh, insertion of one, uh, one of our box times R on all the external legs on the gravitational external legs. 
okay? One insertion, two insertion, three insertion, okay? These are, let's say, the traditional pieces which appear up to three-point function. As you move to four-point functions, as we saw for the TT, we saw this zero residue part, which is a value invariant terms from the point of view of the effective action. And the effective action doesn't see, okay? And uh, uh, so uh, this term is part, should be considered part of the anomaly. And uh, it can be uh, corresponds for the level of uh, effective action in flat space time to this piece, which uh, is part of the result, at least for the TTJJ, um, should be part of the uh, modifications of the uh, Rigert action. So um, I think uh, I can uh, conclude with this. Uh, um, I apologize for being late and uh, I can stop my talk and uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'm here and even afterwards, eventually you can contact me. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, nice talk. Is there any question or comment? Thank you, Professor. Okay, I heard some nice but... I see Manuel connected, H bar. Yes. Hi, Manuel. Hi, Claudia. I do have a question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, one comment first. Mm -hmm. um, um, the mismatch you found between the, the um, let's say, the effective action uh, obtained by the integration of the bile anomaly and the, and the perturbative calculation. Um, it reminds me, I mean, reminds me some uh, similar uh, um, feature which appears because the problem is the connection of effective action computed, let's say, in, in a non-trivial background and the one which is uh, proceeding through a perturbative expansion around the flat background, right? So higher yes. order correlators. Uh, uh, something similar happened in, in the computation of the vacuum energy in, in, in the same kind of theories, conformal, uh, uh, classically conformal invariant theories, so, where uh, you compute uh, vacuum energy from the uh, effective action approach. You can think that in the, I mean, if you have a geometry which has very one dimension in time is very large, you might think that the coefficient of this uh, time parameter uh, is just the vacuum energy. Okay, in the Euclidean approach, at least. Well, it found it was found in the 70s that there was one factor, one half missing. Oh. And it took, uh, let's say, uh, quite a few years till uh, some people, uh, Bunch and Davis, found mm -hmm. that there was a theoretical misunderstanding. So the vacuum energy has extra contributions which are not coming from the effective action because it's some quantum uh, expectation value. It's a correlator, let's say, in your language. And finally, uh, these were the solutions. So people are computing two different things. In your case, it's not like that. I mean, because you you are computing exactly the same thing. You just right. take I mean, variation of the effective action. But the three-point function, Manuel, like the level of three-point function, the checks work for both uh, actions. Uh, uh, so, yeah, but uh, there is a, you, it's a, it's a four point function that something appears I, because I, you I, have more freedom. So when you increase the degrees of freedom, you have more possibilities. So yeah, that, but for me the point is uh, uh, I discussed these things with Matteo, also with Ricardo, and uh, also Mario. I mean uh, the point is um, Rieger solution right. Um, fixes the, this sigma that appears in the local action, right? It um, comes from a constraint. Yes. And um, it's not the general solution of, uh, I mean, you're using a conformal decomposition, you're extracting this Dilaton, then you are solving for the Dilaton, and you, you are using, uh, I mean, the Dilaton, uh, uh, you could rescate the Dilaton, let's say, from. You mean R, it's not background independent? You mean that this. Right. Yes. So the question is uh, you are imposing one constraint. So there is a, a fiducial metric hidden there, right? Mm. 
I mean, sure. because uh, you're uh, fixing fixing sigma means that you're fixing the fiducial metric. So you're writing everything in a, let's say in terms of the complete metric, but actually you are saying, look, the G is G bar time exponential of sigma or two sigma, whatever. So saying what is sigma means that you are also choosing G bar right now. Uh, and uh, the Riger, Riger forces gives a constraint on, I mean, when you solve uh, the scaling relation, as you will know, of course, but uh, Riger scaling relation, then uh, where you extract the Dilaton, you are finding a special so specific solution. So you are imposing a constraint on the fiducial metric. That's the point. And so it's not clear to me whether this constraint allows you to go to the flat space time limit. And that might be that might be one of the reasons. But mm -hmm. you know, that's the reason why you don't have conservation probably um, and as you can you don't have a conservation for that entity. Concerning uh, uh, concerning the anomaly, I mean, I would expect uh, that, uh, you know, that also the anomalous word identities are, are violated. That's the point. So uh, it's, um, it's, it's an issue. I mean, I don't know whether Matteo is here. He may want to add some comments. I mean, uh, um, I mean, my, my point of view is that it's unclear at the moment. I mean, I... I Matteo left. No, no, Matteo is connected. Matteo? Yeah. 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 Well, you can switch sorry. on the camera, maybe. Yeah, you can say something. Yeah. There was another Matteo. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Well, I don't know whether if there is a problem the, on the degrees of freedom that actually Mar was saying. But uh, as Claudio was saying, actually, I mean, these two effective actions satisfies the constraint at the level three point function. And the point is that. Apparently, I mean, for instance, the Rigert one has a, a strange behavior because in that case, you have to consider this uh, green function of this uh, fourth order operator that gives you log terms and something uh, very strange in the anomaly part, in the trace anomaly part. Indeed, in, um, instead for the Fratkin um, cycling action um, is similar to this, uh, uh, to these results that Claudio is showing you, uh, this last slide, but the coefficients are a little bit different. So um, I, I'm, right now, we don't know actually what's, what's going on, why these two effective actions are not working, probably just because they are using a particular uh, background. This is, so they are not so general, let's say. So in two dimension, we don't have this problem because the Polyakov action is unique and uh, we, you don't have actually to choose any background because everything is uh, uh, vile. Uh, uh, you can vile map any background to have vile flat metric. Mm -hmm. So um, in that case, you don't have this problem. But, but, but there is also another thing which doesn't uh, do well for uh, Rigert. I mean, uh, there are double poles. Yeah, that's one. So, yeah. you know, the double poles uh, disappear at the level of three point function. You know, there is this story of double poles that goes back to, you know, uh, well, uh, Deser uh, claimed that there were double poles already the level three point function. Then uh, Neil, uh, so we show that the split computation, there were no double poles, but the four point function, there are these double poles. Now, is that because uh, the expansion is tricky of these fourth order operators, but we don't understand why it shouldn't be the case also for the three point function, because the level of three point functions. You still have a hierarchy, right? Because the three point function or two point function. So these equations are still hierarchical and they are satisfied by both, uh, so both gauges, I would say. Yeah. So it's when you come to four point function, something you know, kicks in. And, um, and you see also the consistency between uh, the perturbative analysis that you do uh, for the 40, right? As I was telling you, the 40 was obvious that it was evident that there was this extra term that. There was a, a part of the anomaly action in such a way that the anomaly and the anomaly free part uh, uh, were both conserved and satisfy in a parallel way conform word identities, one anomalous, the other homogeneous. And uh, here you see the same pattern appearing. So, uh, so it seems that it's really structural, this, pro this point. But needs to be understood. Um, uh, because I, I think that the identification of the of the the Dilaton of phi, this sigma, whatever sigma r in Rigert, 
is, is a, comes from a constraint. I mean, it fixes a background metric. And it's not clear to me that, uh, that, 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 that metric actually you can expand, uh, uh, expand and, and uh, actually go to the flat limit. But we can discuss, I mean, I can, I can describe you more privately, more, more detail these things. Maybe other people are not interested. So when do you expect to have your preprint on the archive? Probably this, uh, this week, right, Matteo? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we just, uh, we, we have been going, you know, checking thoroughly everything uh, because the computation is very, it's a, comp it's a perturbative computation, but it's, uh, it's complete, the classification of the form factors. Uh, so then according to, let's say, the metals can there is in collaborators, right? They did it up to three point functions for the tensor case. So we have applied exactly the same rules and everything. Uh, so, you know, we get enough experience on uh, this formalism. So, which has been extremely helpful, of course. I mean, we have to give credit to them for developing it, which is uh, highly non trivial. But uh, our interest in that, uh, that's the reason why in the past we considered a free field theory because we wanted to, to see what were the implications at the level of the formal normal action. Now we can see something. And the last thing I want to say, I think the zero mode of the of these operators somehow delta four, as you remember, you mentioned it once in prior discussion, should play some kind of role. Hmm. They also play a role in two dimensions. In yeah. the polyacro faction. You have zero modes there too. Yeah, it would be nice to discuss afterwards. Thank you for the question. Maybe uh, you can check uh, the chat because yes, uh, shared, uh, uh, has anybody asked something? I don't know to, to check. Uh, <laughs> I need to learn. Oh, yeah, here. Uh, I don't know. I don't see anything, right? Mm, uh, discussion uh, type. If you click on the discussion, okay, because uh, we received some email. Uh, oh, discussion, uh, where should I click? If you click discussion, there is some, uh, some uh, on, the chat, chat. Top, chat. Uh, on chat, yeah. on chat. Yeah, see, on, chat. Uh, ah, chat, chat, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. so sorry, see, yeah. Okay, let's see. I've already to anyone. There was for a uh, message by Metro government. Okay. No, sorry, I'm curious as to what you mean by an analysis for provided driver from section appear to be inconsistent with the perturbative result. <laughs> um, and also the, the message before, also it's uh, from him. From, uh, yes, him. yes. Um, no, well, I, I, let's see, from four point functions. Mm, uh, Yes, appears to be inconsistent. I mean, th this is the inconsistency, right? Because uh, we want uh, conservation word identity. So if uh, if an effective action doesn't, sorry, it doesn't satisfy the conservation word identity, I mean, uh, there is a problem. And uh, so, but okay, I'll add, add the value invariant terms which are responsible for this, maybe. No, we usually, I mean, we associate the conservation word identity with just the formal covariance. So if something is covariant, then uh, or the film frame is variant, then it should have a conservation word identity. So if you take one of these operators, the way they are formulated, they appear to be uh, covariant, right? If I'm not wrong. So, uh, uh, so I don't want to say anything wrong at the moment because we don't know we actually, but, uh, uh, we are confident the computations are correct. So conservation word identities are violated uh, unless uh, we introduce these extra P's. This P is actually, is actually um, from the point of view of effective action is very invariant. Yes, that's true. But um, so why, why an action doesn't do that? Okay, because misses the value invariant terms. Well, if you miss the value invariant terms, I would say, Maybe that's fine. We just add these terms. Unfortunately, we don't have the expression to all orders. We know them only for this particular correlator. It's unlikely that we would be able to, to find to all orders what is the value invariant terms that needs to be added to 
know, Riger's action or to uh, Fratkin Velkovichki's action. I think I've answered. I'll talk to him probably tomorrow or later tonight. Is there any other question or comments? Okay, if you're not, uh, we would like to thank you again. For thank you, nice thank talk. you, Ada, Ayman, and uh, Matteo for organizing these talks. They are very successful, very very interesting, and people can watch uh, watch the talks afterwards. So it's very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks again. And I uh, thank you to everybody for attending. Huh? So uh, thank you, uh, everybody, and uh, see you next year with a new uh yes. tema. <laughs> okay, okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Nice day. Bye bye. Ciao, Claudio. Ciao, Ma uh, Manel. If you are on Skype, we can uh, talk, or if you want, uh, we can Not continue. Now. now I have another meeting. <laughs> whenever, whenever you want. Okay. okay. Send me an email. Okay. After bye bye. the after you post the archive, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, bye bye. <laughs> take care. Bye bye. Take care. Take care. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.